we've got George over here. He's a veteran of the Gulf War. So George, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm George Clegg, uh, and I was the signal staff sergeant with A Squadron, 1st the Queen's Dragoon Guards in the Gulf. We initially started out as the reconnaissance red, uh, squadron for 7 Armoured Brigade, the Desert Rats, which is why I'm wearing this particular insignia here. And then later on we came under command of the 16 5th Lancers and the uh, Royal Artillery Reconnaissance uh, um, uh, element. Now basically what, what we used to do is we were the eyes and ears of the uh, brigade and we used to go forward and recce all the Iraqi positions that the battle groups were then subsequently going to attack. And we operated from a range of vehicles called Combat Vehicle Reconnaissance Tracked. They're all on the same chassis and you'll see some of the uh, others later, things like the Scimitars and the Scorpions, the Strikers, the Spartans and the recovery vehicles. But this particular vehicle is called a Sultan Command Vehicle. And basically this is from where all the command and control of all the troops who were operating forward was controlled from. Now you used to have three command vehicles in, uh, in, in the squadron. You had this command vehicle, call sign Zero Bravo, that used to have the squadron leader in and would operate and control all the troops who were operating forward. You'd have a support command vehicle called Zero Charlie and basically their uh, role was to talk back to the higher headquarters to tell them what we were doing. And then you also had another additional um, command vehicle similar to this called Zero Delta inside which all the intelligent people used to sit and be able to work out what the enemy were doing. So basically from this, this is where command and control was exercised from. So just to give you a quick sort of pointed tour from here, sat forward is clearly the driver. I used to sit in this seat here, which was the commander's seat, heads up, and then I had a, a, a GPMG machine gun for my local protection. Sat in the corner would be the radio operator. Now I had a six foot five radio operator operating in this CV, and the poor bloke had to operate from there for, for over 24 hours at a time and we used to have to keep him fed and watered and then sat here on these bench seats here would be the squadron leader who'd be looking at the maps and controlling the troops and he'd be supported by what was known as the battle captain who would also be sat here and the other command vehicles had similar crew configurations and basically what you could do in these vehicles, because there's a threat of nuclear, biological and chemical attack, is that you can close the doors, close all the hatches and then switch on the NBC filtration system, forces the air out and over pressurises in here to keep the gas out. It was very hot over there. It was absolutely boiling. You know, you're talking temperatures of 40 degrees during a regular day. So you can imagine if you're in one of these things for any extended period of time, it was really tough op operating from this particular vehicle. Um, we had a few near scrapes. Um, at one touch this time that when we were attacking a major uh, uh, Iraqi objective called Objective Lead, um, we were looking forward and then from behind us an Iraqi T-59 tank appeared on the horizon. The back door was open so I shouted emergency evacuation and the driver took off and we started weaving around and the battle captain's hanging on to the door to try and close it and the most important piece of kit on the vehicle fell off which was our field kitchen that we used to do all the kit cooking on. Anyway, we managed to evade that particular instant and, uh, uh, and get away from the tank, and we continued on doing the uh, actual attack. So George, before we step inside, could you talk to us about some of the equipment we find on your rear? Hats? Yeah, th there's not, all the equipment clearly is, is not here, but basically, as you can see, you had racks on the side here, where all the uh, uh, weapons, weapons are stowed. Uh, what you've got here is an SA-80, which was a, a, a weapon that had just been introduced at the time of the Gulf. Now, in actuality, 
it was only the infantry battalions that had that particular weapon. We used to have submachine guns for our close protection, um, and I don't know if you've ever seen Star Wars, but actually those are the guns that the, that, that the stormtroopers used. Um, so, there were, so basically we had submachine guns. That's the internal water tank here. Uh, uh, and basically what you also had, the most key piece of equipment on the, on the vehicle, was the boiling vessel. Normally situated up the front, but what you could do is when you were static, we used to put it on there, and basically it was a kettle. And being British, clearly we like our tea, and that's where you made your brews from. So basically that's the sort of uh, outside of the, uh, of the command vehicle. Behind here, is where everybody would put their uh, uh, personal kit and stowage um, and uh, all the other bits and pieces and then really everything else would be stowed on the top or on the sides and we used to have to do a lot of modifications to these vehicles so when you go around the outside you'll see a lot of bins those are actually from chieftains that we cut down and adapted and put on the side of the vehicles so we could uh, get more kit and, and, and uh, equipment onto it. Right. So now let's step inside the vehicle and can you tell us some can you tell us about the maps inside? Yeah, yeah, sure. 